Welcome to Can the State Save the Economy? One of the things that I've noticed is that whether you're in Rome or in Amsterdam or in London, the question that comes up time and time again in these discussions uh, is the question of what is the relationship between the state and the market. And one of the things that I find is there's a continuous demand uh, to rebalance this relationship between the state and the market, which are almost invariably based on the premise that the current economic crisis is an outcome of the deregulation of the financial market, that somehow too much deregulation is in some shape or form uh, responsible for the credit crunch and what happened after that. And one of the arguments that is almost unquestioned uh, in certainly in European societies is that therefore what is required is a, a certain process of re-regulation where through systematic or at least a more systematic form of state intervention, regulation, particularly the financial markets but also other sectors, becomes increasingly institutionalized. Now myself, I find this uh, orientation quite puzzling. And the reason why I find it quite puzzling is because there seems to be an assumption which is almost rarely questioned that we have just come through a neoliberal era uh, of incredibly intense liberalism where the state had a very small, undistinguished role within social and economic life. And yet the calls for the state to play a greater role, a more active role, overlook the fact that this institution already has a formidable presence in the domain of economic and has had that presence for a very, very long time. This is shown, for example, by the fact that in almost every country we have seen, for, again, for a very long time, very large uh, budget deficits, and certainly that's the case today. In a country like the United Kingdom, but also elsewhere, it's without a doubt that the public sector has played a crucial role in the creation of new jobs. And when you look at the new jobs that have been created in Europe, you will find that the public sector has been an important source of creating those jobs. You find that, in fact, many of the financial policies that are inextricably linked uh, to the world global recession are actually part and parcel of the policies that the state fairly systematically produced, from having low interest rate regimes to an orientation towards encouraging consumer spending and also towards encouraging the housing booms in different societies. The state hasn't just simply uh, sort of uh, been a, a neutral observer. They've been fairly active in promoting this. So the question that we have to ask ourselves, what can the state do? You know, what is the state? What is the role of the state today? And before we answer that question, we do, we do need to understand that there's a fine balancing act that any democratic state uh, has got to be involved in. That is an irresolvable tension that they're kind of confronted with, which is on the one hand, they have to restructure economic life and establish the conditions for future growth. I mean, that's something that, at least rhetorically, most governments recognize. But at the same time as recreating these conditions, the state is also has the pressure of political expediency of trying to preserve standards of living, standards of employment in these current times, including savings and welfare. And it seems to me that there's a contradiction between these two imperatives, which during the current times, most policymakers are very reluctant to spell out. And one of the things I find so frustrating about our government in the United Kingdom is how there's a real uh, desire to evade spelling out that there are some very difficult decisions to, uh, to be made in relation to that. Now, I know that some people try to overcome this contradiction between the imperative of future economic growth and maintaining living standards by promoting consumption, by arguing that somehow, by increasing demand through state expenditure, we could stimulate the economy and eventually we could both have prosperity or a degree of prosperity and also economic growth. But I think that's a, a relatively naive way of looking at it. If you give more money to clapped out car industries, uh, it's not going to do very much for the future growth of any society, nor will it do very much good for the workers who are still employed in there because their living standards in the long run will be compromised. So what is the state that we need under these circumstances? Well, it seems to me that it's obvious uh, uh, that it's wrong to counterpose the state to the market because in the 21st century, the state has an indispensable role to play in creating the conditions 
for global recovery. It will do that not by becoming an even greater regulator, being more obsessively involved in micromanagement, nor by being the uninhibited printer of money. It will do that by encouraging a strategic approach towards diversification away from reliance on consumer spending or financial services towards the restructuring of the economy. And it seems to me that a state that's going to be effective in creating the conditions for future growth will have to focus on at least five things. It will have to focus on science and innovation and encourage a, a culture and an environment where science and innovation can thrive. It will have to have an industrial policy of some sort, not industry narrowly defined, but a, an orientation towards a, an industrial policy in order to restructure uh, that particular sector. It will have to have something serious to say about infrastructure and doing something about making sure that uh, there are conditions created where our infrastructure uh, can improve and, and, and evolve. It will have to have a very clearly worked out energy policy, and that's obvious, I think most people understand why it is important that we have a more productive and a more reliable energy sector. And it will also, very importantly, should be playing an, uh, a useful role in encouraging new startups. I think the emphasis has got to be not on saving the old, but in encouraging new startups and uh, in, in new innovative firms uh, that can uh, be more productive in the future. And that's, broadly speaking, the role that I would assign for the state. But there's a problem. And the problem is this. The state and the public sector is not the most efficient of institutions uh, in current society. There are some very big problems with the state that are specific to our circumstances, and then there are five of them that I want to draw to your attention. I think one thing we, can, we know about this, the current state, and this is particularly an Anglo-American phenomenon, but it is also more widespread, is that the state has become incredibly risk averse, but more importantly, also responsibility averse. It really evades responsibility uh, in all kinds of ways, to the point at which it's quite happy at continually outsourcing its authority. The state has become this contracting out state, and quite often people say, that's brilliant, that's privatization. You know, we have new PFIs and various other things. This, this is really good. Uh, we, we're now relying on private initiative. But most of the time, what the state is really doing is refusing to take responsibility for the fact that it cannot provide world-class education to English children. And because it, would, it cannot really do that, doesn't know how to go about doing it, it kind of hands over uh, uh, the responsibility to other sectors. I mean, sometimes this takes on grotesque forms. I don't, it was really brought home to me, and nobody's more cynical than I am about the state. When I heard about those two soldiers getting shot in the barracks in Northern Ireland, and I thought that, you know, that's, you know, look what's going on there. What I find quite interesting was that an army barrack was being protect, protected by a, by a private security firm. Right? I mean, just think about it, right? The, the, the state has historically taken responsibility for the, the defense of the nation. Now you've got these two private uh, security guards. I don't know if you ever met any of these guys. They, I wouldn't want to be protected by them myself, certainly not an army barrack in Northern Ireland, who then decide, and this is what they say, they, they, they basically said afterwards, we knew what was happening. You know, we could see the guys coming with the guns, but that's, we weren't really trained for it. We didn't have the health and safety you know, sort of uh, training to deal with something like that. Uh, and that kind of contracting out, whether it's in prisons or elsewhere, is a bad thing, not because I'm against other people running stuff, but because almost invariably it's the state recognizing that it cannot do something effectively. It's not taking responsibility. You know, and, and, and therefore I think whenever things are done like that, even when there's a good reason for it, we should be suspicious, as I was when uh, the new Labour government decided to uh, make the Bank of England independent. I've got no problem with the Bank of England independent. It just so happens that cynically I drew the conclusion that the reason why they wanted the Bank of England independent was to not to take you know, responsibility for the policies that, that may or may not be pursued by it. There's an arm's length distance, and we do this with the EU. How many times have you heard governments say, it's not our fault, it wasn't our responsibility, it's an EU directive uh, that kind of made us do, do that. So that's the first problem. The second problem with the state, and it's linked to its contracting out, the outsourcing of its authority, is it's become very short-termist and one-sidedly tactical. 
far too subject to political calculations. And therefore, it finds it very difficult to make hard choices. I mean, I hear very few politicians saying in the 21st century that sooner or later the public sector will have to be cut quite massively, quite seriously. You know, who, who says that? Uh, who spells out the consequences of these public expenditure cuts that have been sneaked in into the last budget? That doesn't really happen. So the state doesn't spell these things out at the moment, finds it difficult to make hard choices. Thirdly, and something as a sociologist I'm most worried about, is the fact that the Anglo-American state, but also elsewhere in Europe, suffers from a decline of a public sector ethos. One of the consequences of what happened over the last 20 or 30 years is that uh, the public sector ethos and the institutional spirit which guided certain sectors of state activity, one of at least professed neutrality and objectivity and disinterestedness and professionalism, has become eroded you know, through an army of consultants coming in and out on a short-term basis through people no longer looking upon the civil service in the way that they might have done in a different kind of era. As a result of it, a distinct institutional consciousness and a loyalty to a, a distinct way of do, doing things does not really exist. And that's why you will find that if you ever go and talk to civil servants in any department, you know, they're more interested in you because they're looking for jobs, you know, so they're looking for making contacts, than in their own institution. It's very difficult or very rare that you will meet people working for the state, employed by the state, who are able to express uh, uh, that kind of less free de corps, which any state institution needs, if it's to be effective. I mean, it, it is, a, to me, a very worrying phenomenon because it ultimately means that these institutions lack the institutional capacity to respond. Ironically, you need a fairly conservative state institution in order to be able to be experimentative. Unless you have a, a sturdy foundation on which you can build, it's very difficult to be future-oriented because you're continually you know, kind of re redoing the thing that, that's been done before. You know, high levels of turnover, no institutional loyalty. It doesn't make for uh, uh, an, an effective state. Fourthly, the consequence of this is that I would argue that the state, as it's now constituted in many parts of Europe, lacks any organic or creative impulse to innovate. I don't think you can expect very much innovative thinking just to look at our new Labour government uh, or, uh, or any of the institutions uh, to kind of innovate. In fact, it's interesting because the government continually sets up these quasi-state organizations whose mission, and, and I always cry when I heard the word mission, whose mission it is to innovate, to, you know, blue sky thinking. You have an organization called Nesta. I don't know if you ever come across Nesta. And their idea is to nurture innovation. Uh, well, the most innovative thing about Nesta are the color, color of the pamphlets. They got these kind of really freaky pamphlets that they kind of produce, which look very, you know, extremely edgy. But that's about as innovative as you get uh, in these kinds of circumstances. And fifthly, what we have, and this is quite endemic to the state, is that we have a very inefficient public sector. I mean, particularly in Britain, but it is a very inefficient public sector. It, it's a kind of a public sector that cannot teach children how to read or write in a systematic way. A national health service uh, that is, you know, in, in terms of the amount of money spent on it, is, is highly inefficient. I mean, you know, it, all you got to do is even compare it to France uh, and to numerous other kinds of societies, and which, you know, is, is so inefficient that it cannot even manage and run a computer system. And they say it will take us six months it will take us six months to get a full helpline in place. Now, call me naive and technologically a dinosaur, but even I don't think it, takes, it should take the British state six months to uh, establish a helpline. My wife could do it in two weeks. I can guarantee you that. There's, there's, it's not exactly rocket science to do something like that. And it seems to me that that kind of inefficiency uh, in the public sector uh, is not something that's going to be overcome uh, for, a, for, a, for a certain period of time. The reason why I want to spell this point out is because the issue at stake is not to artificially counterpose the state to the market, but to understand that there are different kinds of states. There are states that are weak, strong, smart, and stupid. Uh, and in between, we have failed states in many parts of the world. We're very good at talking about failed states in Africa. We're not so good at recognizing the failed states that are more homegrown. So 
There is that kind of issue. And similarly, markets are not always robust. They're not always perfect. There are you know, imperfect markets and markets that are highly you know, sort of in need of major overhaul. So let's not counterpose those two things. What we do need to do is to recognize that, uh, and this is something that we can all do something about, is that we do need new political policies that can bring about uh, or encourage the construction of a state that's more worthy of the 21st century and, and more worthy of, of our needs. And it seems to me that, you know, yes, we do need a state to contain the destructive effects of the global crisis. That's important. But we mustn't think for one second that the state can save the economy. It cannot save the economy for the very simple reason that we should not be saving it, but restructuring it. Thank you. Uh, capitalism was really a product of a synergy between the state and the economy. If you go back to the birth of capitalism in, 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 in Venice, uh, it was definitely propped up by the government all the time. And when, when it got started, you know, Venetian historians uh, would tell us that it only took 20, 30 years before capitalism collapsed and had to be saved by the state. So the state definitely plays a role, and I think it's important that uh, we have been through this extreme period when, when it, oh, the Cold War, where, where you either had, you know, the market was bad and the state was the solution, or the other way around, the, 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 the market was good and the, state was, and, 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 and the state was the problem. You know, neither of those are true. It, it's a matter of finding a division of labor. And, and, and I think what, what happened after the fall of the Berlin Wall, this kind of triumphalism, is that we, we left the state to the unimportant decisions like the curvature of cucumbers, uh, but kept it out of some very important regulations. Also, I think we have to learn a lot from history. We all know about Keynes, we want to have Keynes back, but we do forget about uh, Schumpeter. And the division of labor between Schumpeter and Keynes in the crisis in 29 was that Schumpeter had the explanation why the crisis. And a very important element of this was a clustering of technological innovations which led to a run on the stock exchange and led to a bubble. If that bubble is not deflated in a controlled way, which we didn't manage to do in 1999, we get these continuous bubbles. So Schumpeter had, had the explanation for the crisis and Keynes had the medicine. Schumpeter said that you can't, the government can't solve the crisis. It has to burn out alone. I always thought that was very cruel. Uh, a lot of people unemployed, you know, children starving, you don't want, you don't want to do anything about it, but now we start to understand why. And, and in order to understand this, you have to understand that what we call the economy really consists of two different things. On the one hand, it's the real, the real sector producing goods and services of all kinds, and then you have what Schumpeter called the accounting units, and these can come out of joint with each other. And this has happened continuously. And it, hap you know, it happens when compound interests, the, the force of compound interest is such that money grows much faster than the real economy, right? And these economists, continental economists, have been very uh, aware of this. And of course, that was one of the reasons why you had a gold standard, that you couldn't create as much money as you wanted. So the, the, the gold standard was there hindering the solution that you couldn't print money in the 1930s, but now that we have got rid of the gold standard, we have the problem that perhaps the government is intervening too much and saving the financial sector, but not saving the real economy. So I, I agree with the first speaker that we, you know, what we have to do is to save the real economy. Uh, and, and if wages and, and, and livelihood is being threatened in the periphery, saving house, housing prices in London or saving the stock exchange is not going to do the trick. So therefore, it's the cruel world of Schumpeter, you know, you, you should let it burn out. You know, the, 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 the financial sector has to go on such a big rock that it understands that the game is over. And this is the dilemma I think we, we're facing. Okay. Uh, and I certainly agree with the previous speakers that uh, the state has always had a role in capitalism and, and that is very much part of the crisis we're in. So the sense we're in a crisis of of the financial sector or the economy right now, this is also a crisis of the state. Um, the liberal state was always about underwriting risk. The, the contract, the social contract, was about, uh, was about protecting one's security. 
And what one's seen, though, since then, over the last, you know, certainly over the last 100 years, is the role of the state becoming more and more engaged in underwriting every single conceivable kind of risk. The more one underwrites risk, the more one encourages the very risky behaviour that one's trying to uh, protect. What follows from that is that the more one underwrites risk, the more one has to uh, regulate people's behaviour. So we have, you know, in the, the more absurd level, we have, you know, why can my children not play on roundabouts and seesaws any longer in playgrounds or, you know, have to sit in car seats till the age of 11 or, you know, and then in the financial sector, we have the same, you know, intense regulation. So the challenge we've got now is to work out in the future what, what's, what risk we do want the state to underwrite and what we're prepared to afford and how much regulation we're prepared to accept in response to that. Using state resources simply to try and pick up the tabs for every conceivable risk in society just will ultimately bankrupt the people. And I think the, the one thing I'd say that's encouraging in the current environment, the first is that the state is not about to get bigger. I mean, although the state has taken a big role in saving this crisis, I mean, basically Britain is bust. And uh, so the state is going to have to withdraw. So we're going to have to face this debate. And the second one I'd say is that, that actually, despite um, the financial crisis, uh, I don't detect any particular appetite amongst the uh, you, you know, UK political uh, classes for actually uh, increasing the role of the state, any, state anyway in the economy. I think one thing that's notable in the financial crisis is that the government went out of its way to avoid nationalising the banks. Now, I find myself in a bizarre position of actually thinking they should have nationalised the banks that went bust. Uh, and they actually tried to duck that, um, uh, that, that difficult decision in order to try and Keep, because they didn't, and the main reason they gave is that the government didn't trust itself to actually run a bank. Uh, I think quite rightly too. I mean, you can't trust them to run a country. You can't trust them to run anything. So, so we need to have the debate about what it is that we want the state to do. Okay, thank you very much. I think I'll just start off by having my own stab at uh, what the state should be doing and shouldn't be doing. Uh, briefly, I think the state should provide security, enforce the law, oversee free and fair competition in markets, and in the provision of public services and uh, actively encourage infrastructure. I think it's very important to put a number on the state um, because I am of the view that we did not in get into this crisis because the state is not big enough. Now, at the moment, we're running a state on 45% of GDP. This is the UK. Um, across Western Europe, uh, it gets as high as 60. America, sort of late, late 30s. Um, now, if you go back to, say, 1912, it was 8% uh, in Britain. I'm of the view that you could run a modern, mature, liberal democracy uh, about the same level as when, what it was under Prime Minister Wilson, between 25 and 30%. Now, uh, we've heard of some talk about regulation. Um, and I would invite you, uh, first of all, to appreciate that uh, regulation had no small part in this financial crisis that, that happened. Having said that, I do think that the basic problem with, uh, with this crisis that has not been explored uh, is information asymmetry. And where we don't have exposure of information, which I think uh, is uh, a good reason to have regulation in this area, is with the uh, breakdown of the uh, specific asset portfolios uh, of the banks, because what you do then is you actually inform depositors, cut bank, bank customers, and they get a rough idea of what kind of risk the bank is taking on. You don't tell the regulator, and our regulator, let's face it, the FSA, has been pretty rubbish. Um, so finally, I'd like to leave you with these parting thoughts. I think there's a lot of people getting poorer and particularly pensioners, and you may say we don't want to help the stock market, but actually I think we do at some point uh, because we do need the capital markets to recover. We have become a society really where we work for our assets. We want to move to a society where our assets work for us. Thank you. I think a lot of interesting points were raised. The, just, just to go back to a point that was raised earlier on about uh, the nationalizing or not nationalizing of the banks in, in, in Great Britain. I, I think it's an interesting uh, sort of issue which historians a hundred years down the road will be asking some questions about because, you know, call me simplistic, but it, it seems to me that a lot of financial institutions have been nationalized in content but not in form. 
Uh, and I think that's really where the problem lies and relates to the point I'm making where, in effect, what you're doing is you're nationalizing. You're, and even in, in the United States, which has, is so much against ideological, against nationalizing, nationalizes these institutions but doesn't call them that. Now, to me, that's not just simply a, a question of uh, momentary dishonesty and also foolish policy because I would have far rather that these banks were just let, you know, sort of allow their natural you know, sort of dynamic, you know, sort of over, overtake them. But okay, you nationalize them, but you don't call it nationalization. It, it, to me, this really smacks of this point I was trying to explain about the outsourcing of authority and, and, and not taking the responsibility uh, for your actions. And I, and I think that at the moment, one of the things that we have to recognize is that the institutions in large parts of the Western world have got, have got this incorrigible, you know, sort of desire to avoid responsibility at all cost. I mean, that's really what, you know, that's, that's, that's really how they work. And I have only gave a few examples, but when you, when you look at the way in which governments are so happy at, at using international institutions to pass the buck, you know, IMF tells us this, United Nations tells us that, but they get trotted to that to explain why you gotta do something that perhaps you wouldn't wanna do otherwise. It's our international obligations you know, that makes us do that. There's a continuous, it's almost like a, 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 a kind of a systematic way in which organizations have worked out strategies not to take responsibility for their action. And I think that the way the state has responded to the existing uh, conjuncture in the global recession is a very good illustration of that. I think it's about time that we use, we kind of drop the word a neoliberal epoch. I mean, unless the word liberal has acquired new connotations and it's actually a, a synonym for state socialism of some sort, I don't know what this neoliberal period was, other than uh, essentially ideological. But by and large, you know, sort of most of what goes for liberalism can be interpreted in entirely different ways as, 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 the, as the state redefining its relationship to the market in a way that I don't see as being at all liberal, but potentially, you know, sort of quite, quite, quite regressive. I want to come across as the most dynamic parts of Western economies, say, taken in Britain's case, the pharmaceuticals industry. Even that, if you look at it, it's dynamic. It's very much dictated by its relationship to the state, you know, through state spending, through NHS spending and so on, as well as through regulation of drugs and so on. So this interspersing of the state and the economy is clearly, um, a, a, you know, the most uh, uh, characteristic form of modern, of modern capitalism. On the other hand, you have this, on every time, a, a reluctance to act. I think the example of the how to sort out the banking uh, problems is the most evident element of it. You know, how do you resolve that paradox of pervasiveness and the reluctance to act? It's not anything that can be understood within the actual technical relations of the state and the economy, but perhaps it does go back in a different way to the 80s and to Thatcherism. Not that Thatcherism was a time of uh, a neoliberal, so of this phony neoliberal crusade, but it was a time in which the economy became much uh, less politicized. Um, and you had a situation where, at that stage, when you had the declaration of Tina, there's no alternative to the market, and that sort of uh, demise of sort of ideological discussions about the economy, it seems it's in the roots of this reluctance to act, combined with the pervasiveness, that paradox is in the de depoliticization of, uh, uh, of economic affairs. And perhaps this whole global crisis is an opportunity to try and reverse that depoliticization, which uh, would at least open up those discussions again. Um, I just wanted to um, pick up on uh, Frank's point about uh, the changing role of the state. And you said that you didn't think that its role was to provide a fiscal stimulus um, or to increase regulation, but to, to have to play a restructuring role. But the, the five points that you outlined about increasing science and innovation, increasing uh, industrial policy, new startups, and, and energy policy, to me that does require quite a big role for the state and probably will require quite a lot of funding. I mean, that, that doesn't just come from nowhere. Um, so could you just explain that, please? Okay. You know, economic activities are different. And some economic activities, it's very difficult to get productivity increase. You know, if you want to, if a symphony orchestra is to play the minute walls more efficiently, it's either do it in 50 seconds or do it with a reduced number of musicians. In both cases, you, 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 you jeopardize quality, right? The problem is that the state tends to be in economic activities like that you know, to care, take care of old people. It's just, it's similar to running a symphony orchestra. Difficult to make it more efficient without jeopardizing the quality. And this is, in, in economics, is called Beaumont's law, right? 
So if the government had been in computers and in, in running airlines, you know, it, you wouldn't have seen its share of GDP grow as fast. But b b because it happens to be in the symphony orchestras type of businesses, you see, the, the, you see the, its share of GDP growing. And I think this is something we should get out in the air rather than, than, than hammering government or, or you know, it's, it's complicated. The kind of guy or woman who gets to the top of the civil service these days uh, is an advisor. You know, they're a politician. What we need, and this is where I, I'm afraid I profoundly disagree, uh, what we need uh, is to change the culture so the people who get to the top are project managers. Yeah. That's what we want. I don't and, disagree uh, with that. And there are many, many things we can do to make uh, the state sector much more efficient in procurement, uh, in the free and open competition of public services. Uh, so what you're doing is you're still having tax-funded public services, but you're actually uh, marketizing them. And so if people fail, they get the push. But this is, you know, we really could get some deflation and some huge productivity growth in the public sector. And uh, I'm actually quite excited about it if we're prepared to try it. I'm not sure about that. I think the unfortunate experience is that when you get in project managers, it completely disrupts the relationship between uh, the, the people that are there, uh, their ways of doing things, in a way that is, isn't helping innovation, but it tends to demoralize them and makes them cynical because they know that it's only a matter of time before the project manager goes away and they're left to pick up the pieces. And, and if you look at the role of consultants in the public sector, I mean, they, they really have been taking the piss out of the public sector to the point at which, you know, sort of, uh, you know, they're, they kind of go in there, you know, we're there to sort the problem out. And invariably from, and I can give you loads and loads of examples, the problem becomes far worse than it was beforehand. And, and that's not surprising because that's the way these things are. It's not organic. It's got no, there's no incentive to stay in there for the long run. And we're talking about institutions that do need to exist in the long run. Nor is there any sensitivity to the way in which you can use the people that work there in the most effective kind of a way. And, and that's partially the reason why we're in such a mess in, in, in so many areas of the public sector. I'm not against, you know, sort of, because uh, I mean, I'm fundamentally a liberal. I'm, I'm all for using the market for all kinds of different things. But when you, when you marry the public sector and the market, you get the worst of both worlds. And, and, and that's generally been the experience, that when you try to fuse the two, you neither get the efficiencies of, of, of the market, the incentive of the people who are running things through, nor the fact that in the public sector there are people who genuinely care about health, education, or whatever. Uh, but, you know, when they see somebody else coming in from nowhere, you know, that, that kind of aspiration to, to, to kind of build a better education system becomes compromised. And, and, and that's the one reason why the British public sector looks so, so poor compared to the, uh, a lot of public sectors in many other European countries. I mean, you know, if, if you ever break a, a, an ankle as I did skiing in France, who doesn't want to be in a French hospital compared to a British NHS hospital? Or if you, you know, send, if you've got children as I do, you know, which school would you rather set, you know, a comprehensive in London, you know, or, 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 or a school maybe in, in Stockholm or, or someplace like that? So I, th I do think that we need to keep these things uh, sort of uh, in perspective. Um, I just want to say one thing about, um, uh, about you know, just getting back to this whole uh, kind of nationalization business because, you know, I am surprised that uh, nationalizing the, the, the banking sectors, I am really surprised by, by the way in which people have refuse to countenance the possibility of just letting the banks pay the consequences of their action. I, I really don't understand why you know, that, you know, people have shied away from that. You know, the recession is not a magical phenomenon that we have no control over. I mean, our response to it does determine what's going to happen. And you know, the short-term attempt to avoid confronting the problem actually makes the problem worse in the long run. I mean, every example of history demonstrates to us that being indecisive, trying to have the best of both worlds, will create lower living standards for people in all sections of society in the long run, will simply create a cumulative process of inefficiency. Whereas if you take more immediate, you know, sort of potentially more painful action in, in the short run, uh, that's like a, a more dramatic action, that's going to have, you know, the, the right kind of consequences. And this is the, this is the one thing I, I cannot grasp as to, you know, why there is such silence on this issue and, and such reluctance and cowardice 
on the part of our political classes in Europe at the moment. Generally, what we, what we can see here, I think, is because of a collapse of political vision and coherence and ideology, there has been a collapse, I think he's right about this, in the public service ethos. And instead, what we see is that every department is out for itself. And, you know, their obsession with themselves is so great that I learned that the Arts Council recently commissioned no fewer than 200 design firms to rebrand local organizations of the uh, Arts Council. This inefficiency in the state, which is peculiarly British, seems to me to follow from the lack of a clear vision uh, for society. And therefore you do get an every man for himself atmosphere in the state as a kind of pale imitation of what happens on the stock market. I think the thing with regulation is there's just no point in having more regulation if you don't change people's behaviours. Um, and I think that um, those sort of softer skills, things that don't cost that much money, but are probably very difficult to do. And I'm interested to hear what you think about that. It's always very interesting when you know people who are quite intelligent and, and kind of sorted, and then they join a state institution. And there's a kind of process of lobotomization that, that takes place when that happens. And they start talking in a language that doesn't make any, any sense, and they start actually not being able to make simple decisions about simple problems. And I think this comes from the essential uh, predicament they're in, which is to be in a position of public authority without having any kind of source of public pressure or public accountability or public connection. So as a result, you invent your kind of, your kind of own fake language and your own way of dealing with things, which has no connection with things on the ground. I thought well, the only interesting policy that there's been in response to the crisis was actually Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, who set up a um, system of state restaurants. He said, uh, he went on state TV and said, you want candles? I give you candles. You want wine? You want, uh, you know, Peruvian, Venezuelan? I give you wine. And the point being that Hugo Chavez, he's not thinking like the state. He's thinking like a guy. Um, and as a, just with quite a lot of uh, money in his pocket. I think in some ways that we need a kind of period of, of, of disruption um, and some slightly kind of whack, wacky ideas before you can approach a sort of public consciousness. I'm not quite sure what's being discussed because is it that what we're saying is we just need bold leadership, some strategy, people who know what they're doing and to be a bit more uh, passionate and enthusiastic about investing? Or is it about a broader um, philosophical idea about the role of the state and the role of the market and, uh, uh, and a collective re relationship to that. Because otherwise, what we're really saying is, perhaps Dan's right, it should be just about project managers that can take a bit of a bold position and invest more. So I'm wondering, um, and, and this is particularly to Frank, who, who laid out the five points, you know, what, 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 what that might mean. What I would take issue with, uh, and this is on the NHS as well, uh, as education, let's not confuse uh, state-directed central government targets with consultants. Now, I think, I think there are lots of things wrong with the NHS, and I agree with you, it's, it's pretty terrible. Uh, and I think a lot of our teachers just aren't left free to get on and teach. You know, that's where I want to go. Um, but on banks, I'm afraid uh, this is just going to go on uh, until we get full disclosure, either in bank losses or between banks, of, of their loan portfolios and how bad and how good they are. Until they know that, they won't start lending to each other, which means that they're going to charge high interest rates to the rest of us. Uh, and uh, I can totally see on public sector ethos um, that it is uh, demotivating uh, when you want to get on with your job, but what you've got is uh, 50 different checkboxes. Uh, you've got, uh, if you're a school, you've got maybe up to 90 different quangos to deal with and the local education authority. Um, so, no, I think there's, there's lots of scope to reform. You know, it's normal that business maximise profits, and it's normal that public sector managers maximise the size of their budgets. Uh, you know, this, is, this has been known for, 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 for 100 years. Uh, but you don't solve the problem, in my view, in, in, the, in the public sector by new public management, which is kind of the ugly twin of neoclassical economics. You know, you, you solve it by go going back to as you said, not too many checks points, you solve it by going back to the, the, the barbarian bureaucrat, the bureaucrat who, who, who really knows his profession and who, who, who um, is able to make decisions without getting hundreds and hundreds of, of, of numbers. You, know, you have to go back to a more understanding and, not, and less quantitative understanding of the world. So we need to reform economics. We need some creative destruction. 
uh, and we need less destructive creation. Destructive creation being subprime and all these, all, all these new financial instruments. I certainly, public sector ethos, so I certainly um, agree it's possible. I certainly agree it's a good thing. Um, I mean, I, my uh, family have all been in the public sector. I mean, my parents, my aunts, uncles, grandparents, so, I mean, it, and, and all of them were absolutely dedicated professionals. Uh, what I noted, though, was that the public sector ethos with, with all of them really was bound up in strong institutions rather than a sense of the public sector. And I think that, uh, that we should be wary of allowing the state to come and underwrite all our risks because the result of that will be just more regulation and lower growth and more intrusion in our lives, and I think that would be a thoroughly bad thing. I think there are three things that can be done that are quite important. I think the first thing is to separate the state and the market much more than the case at the moment and to get rid of all these uh, you know, sort of quasi-private, quasi-state institutions that have really flourished. If you want to see a negative model of what I'm talking about is the EU. I think the EU symbolizes this in the most perfect way where its main ethos is if it moves, regulate. You know, uh, that seems to be what it wants. And it's, Almost the opposite you need, both to have a, a proper state and also to have proper markets because the two don't really mix all that well. And just by the way, on the EU, if, if, you, want, if you are going to vote, vote for anybody that promises to have a referendum on the EU, you know, sort of a constitution as it's not called, you know, sort of, uh, I think that's quite important. Secondly, I think the, uh, uh, the important thing is leadership, you know, sort of, uh, and, 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 and political leadership is, is very important. Uh, in, in, respect, in, in terms of being able to make the kind of uh, spelling out the kind of decisions that, that, are, that are required. And I don't, I don't want to go into it here because it's not really about politics, but that is one of the uh, absent, you know, the really absent uh, elements in, in the calculation today. And, and, and I really do get worried when I see very little signs of people being prepared to spell out to the electorate, to the citizens, you know, what are the challenges facing our societies with any degree of clarity. Thirdly, we do, you know, the state does have certain economic policies that it can be involved in. I think somebody raised a question about, well, you know, industrial policy needs to be funded. And I think that's right. I, I have got no clarity exactly, you know, what the right uh, sort of GDP as state expenditure should be. I, I know it shouldn't be as high as it is now. But I do think that state expenditure itself has got to be re organized away from transfer payments and, and some of the silly things that we spend our public money on towards more potentially productive uh, sort of investments in, in the long run, particularly in relation to infrastructure. But that's a very difficult thing. And also, I think in relation to that, hard decisions that don't necessarily cost money. So one of the problems that small businesses have is, is, a, is a lack of financial you know, sort of infrastructure that can cater for that. And it seems to me that part and parcel of what, 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 what should, be, should be going, taking place now, is to allow the old banks, you know, to kind of go under, because they really are, they are like clapped out car industries, you know, they, they are the financial equivalents. I mean, all these banks, even though they very flash outwardly, you know, in terms of who they are and what they represent, they're the past, right? And they should be seen very much as the past, but we do need new financial institutions, and one of which needs to be our institutions that provide some, some measure of support for precisely those smaller sectors of, of, of industry which uh, you know, have a, an element of innovative capacity within them but are completely left out of the picture. And making those decisions uh, on economic policy which aren't necessarily, don't involve nationalization, don't involve huge expenditures of, of resources, but basically uh, depend on making you know, smart but difficult decisions is, is, is really what we, what we need. I just want to say something about soft skills. I've just written a book which is very cynical about soft skills. Um, mainly not because I don't think that we shouldn't listen or that we shouldn't have the capacity to learn from one another and to pick up signals and all the rest of that. I am really worried about the way in which soft, the term soft skills has led to the formalization of what are normal forms of human behavior and they've been rebranded as a skill uh, one reason why I bring that into discussion, because that's what the state is doing with everything. The state takes everyday experiences that you and I have as human beings, and then rebrands it. It gives us a diploma for it, you know, sort of, and, uh, and leaves it down.